Chapter 20, Girding for War, the North and the South, 1861-1865. Abraham Lincoln solemnly took the presidential oath of office on March 4, 1861, after having slipped into Washington at night, partially disguised to thwart assassination. He thus became the president, not of the United States of America, but the disunited States of America. Seven had already departed, eight more teetered on the edge. The girders of the unfinished Capitol Dome loomed nakedly in the background, as if to symbolize the imperfect state of the Union. Before the nation was restored and the slaves freed at last, the American people would endure four years of anguish and bloodshed, and Lincoln would face torturous trials of leadership, such as have been visited upon few presidents. The Menace of Secession Lincoln's inaugural address was firm yet conciliatory. There was no, there was, there was no conflict, and there would be no conflict, unless the South provoked it. Secession, the president declared, was wholly impractical because, physically speaking, we cannot separate. Here, Lincoln put his finger on a profound geographic truth. The North and South were Siamese twins, bound inseparably together. If they had been divided by the Pyrenees Mountains or the Danube River, a sectional divorce might have been more feasible. But the Appalachian Mountains and the mighty Mississippi River ran the wrong way. Uncontested secession would create new controversies. What share of the national debt should the South be forced to take with it? What portion of the jointly held federal territories, if any, should the Confederate states be allotted? Areas so largely won by Southern blood. How would the fugitive slave law issue be resolved? The Underground Railroad would certainly redouble its activity, and it would have to transport its passengers only across the Ohio River, not all the way to Canada. Was it conceivable that all such problems could have been solved without the armed clashes? A united the United States had hitherto been the paramount republic in the West. If this powerful democracy could take two hostile parts, the European nations would be delighted. They could gleefully transplant to America their ancient concept of the balance of power. Playing the no less ancient game of divide and conquer, they could incite one snarling fragment of the disunited states against the other. The colonies of the European powers in the New World, notably those of Britain, would thus be made safer against the rapacious Yankees, and European imperialists with no unified republic to stand across their path and more easily defy the Monroe Doctrine and seize territory in the Americas. South Carolina assails Fort Sumter. The issue of the divided Union came to a head over the matter of federal forts in the South. As the seceding states left, they had seized the United States' arsenals, mints, and other public property within their borders. When Lincoln took office, only two significant forts in the South still flew the Stars and Stripes. The more important of the pair was square-walled Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, with fewer than 100 men. Ominously, the choices presented to Lincoln by Fort Sumner were all bad. This stronghold had provisions that would last only a few weeks, until the middle of April 1861. If no supplies were forthcoming, its commander would have to surrender without firing a shot. Lincoln, quite understandably, did not feel that such a weak-kneed course squared with his obligations to the federal property. But if he sent reinforcements, South Carolinians would undoubtedly fight back. They would not tolerate a federal fort blocking the mouth of the most important Atlantic seaport. After agonizing indecision, Lincoln adopted a middle-of-the-road solution. He notified the South Carolinians that an expedition would be sent to provision the garrison, though not to reinforce it. But to southernize, provision spelt reinforcement. Provision means give it food and supplies, not arms and weapons. A peaceful uh, provision. A Union naval force was next started on its way to Fort Sumner, a move that the South regarded as an act of aggression. On April 12, 1861, the cannon of the Carolinians opened fire on the fort while crowds in Charleston applauded and waved handkerchiefs. After a 34-hour bombardment, which took no lives, the day's garrison surrendered. The shelling of the fort electrified the North, which at once responded with cries of Remember Fort Sumner and Save the Union. Hitherto, countless Northerners have been saying that if the Southerners wanted to go, they should not be pinned to the rest of the nation with bayonets. Wayward sisters, part in peace with common sentiment expressed even uh, by the commander of the army, war hero General Winfield Scott, now so feeble at 75 that he had, boosted onto, had to be boosted onto his own horse. But the assault on Fort Sumner provoked the North into a fighting pit. The fort was lost. The Union was saved. Lincoln had turned a tactical defeat into a calculated victory. It was crucial. Southerners had wantonly fired upon the glorious stars of the fight, and honor demanded an armed response. Lincoln promptly, April 15th, issued a call to the states for 75,000 militiamen and volunteers sprang to the colors in such enthusiastic numbers that many were turned away, a mistake that was not often repeated. On April 19th and 27th, the 
president proclaimed a leaky blockade of Southern seaports. The call for troops in turn aroused the South much of the attack on Fortuna had aroused the North. I think it's now waging war. The Southern view of an aggressive war on the Confederacy. Virginia, Arkansas, and Tennessee, all of which were located down to the Midwest and Wisconsin, battled pitched at the South and the North. Thus, the southern states began to lend, and the southern states became Union forces, were overcome. Richmond, Virginia, replaced Montgomery, Alabama, as the Confederate capital, too near Washington for strategic comfort on either side. Brothers' Blood and Border Blood. The only slave states left were the crucial border states. The group consisted of Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, and later West Virginia, a mountain white area that somewhat illegally tore itself inside of Virginia in 1861. If the North had fired the first shot, some, of, some or all of these doubtful states probably would have seceded, and the South might well have seceded, succeeded. The border group actually contained a white population more than half that of the entire Confederacy. Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri would almost double the manufacturing capacity of the South and increase by nearly half its supply of horses and mules. The strategic side of the Ohio River flowed along the northern border of Kentucky and West Virginia. Two of its navigable tributaries, Cumberland and Tennessee Rivers, penetrated deep into the heart of the city, where much of the Confederate grain, gunpowder, and iron was produced. Small wonder that Lincoln reportedly said he hoped to have God on his side, but he had to have Kentucky. In dealing with the border states, President Lincoln did not rely solely on moral suasion, but on successful use methods of dubious legality. In Maryland, he declared martial law where needed, and sent his troops as the state threatened to cut off Washington to the north. Lincoln also deployed Union soldiers in West Virginia, and notably in Missouri, where they fought beside Unionists in a local civil war within a larger civil war. An official statement on the North's war aims was finally influenced by the teetering border states. At the very outset, Lincoln was obliged to declare publicly that he was not fighting to free the blacks. An anti-slavery declaration would no doubt have driven the border states into the welcoming arms of the South. An anti-slavery war was also extremely unpopular in the so-called butternut region of southern Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. That area had been settled largely by Southerners who carried the racial differences with them when they crossed the Ohio River. It was to be in a hotbed of pro-Southern sentiment throughout the war. Sensitive to this delicate political calculus, Lincoln insisted repeatedly, even though undercutting his moral high ground, that his paramount purpose was to save the Union at all costs. Thus, the war began not as one as between slave soil and free soil, but one for the Union, with slaveholders on both sides and many pro-slavery sympathizers in the North. Slavery also colored the character of the war in the West. In the Indian Territory, present-day Oklahoma, most of the five civilized tribes, the Cherokees, Creeks, Choctaws, Saws, and Seminoles, sided with the Confederacy. Some of these Indians, notably the Cherokees, owned slaves and thus felt themselves being made, making common cause with the slave-owning South. To secure their loyalty, the Confederate government agreed to take over federal payments to the tribes and invited the Native Americans to send delegates to the Confederate Congress. In return, the tribes supplied troops to the Confederate Army. Meanwhile, a rival faction of Cherokees and most of the Plains Indians sided with the Union, only to be rewarded after the war with a relentless military campaign to herd them onto reservations or into oblivion. Unhappily, the conflict between Billy Yank and Johnny Reb was a brother's war. There were many northern volunteers from the southern states and many southern volunteers from the northern states. The mountain whites of the south sent, some, uh, sent north some 50,000 men, and the loyal slave states contributed some 300,000 soldiers to the Union. In many a family of the border states, one brother rode north to fight with the blue, another south to fight with the gray. Senator Cretendon of Kentucky, who fathered the abortive Cretendon Compromise, fathered two sons. One became a general in the Union Army, the other a general in the Confederate Army. Lincoln's own Kentucky-born wife had four brothers who fought. Balance of forces. When war broke out, the South seemed to have great advantages. The Confederacy could fight defensively behind interior lines. The North had to invade the vast territory of the Confederacy, conquer it, and drag it back bodily back into the Union. In fact, the South did not have to win the war in order to win its independence. If it merely fought the invaders to a draw and stood firm, Confederate independence would be won. Fighting on their own soil for self-determination and preservation of their way of life, Southerners at first enjoyed an advantage in morale as well. Militarily, the South, from the opening volleys of the war, had the most talented officers. Most conspicuous among a dozen or so first-rate commanders was gray-haired General Robert E. Lee, whose knight knightly bearing and chivalric sense of honor embodied the Southern ideal. Lincoln had unofficially offered him command of the Northern armies, but when Virginia seceded, Lee felt honor-bound to go with his native state. 
Lee's chief lieutenant for much of the war was black-bearded Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson, a gifted tactician, tactical theorist, and a master of speed and deception. Besides their brilliant leaders, ordinary Southerners were also bred to fight. Accustomed to managing horses and bearing arms from boyhood, they made excellent cavalrymen and foot soldiers. Their high-pitched rebel yell, yeehaw, was designed to strike terror into the hearts of fuzz-chinned Yankee recruits. There's nothing like it on the side of the infernal region, one northern soldier declared. The peculiar corkscrew sensation that it sends down your backbone can never be told. You have to feel it. As one immense farm, the South seemed to be handicapped by its scarcity of factory. Yet, by seizing federal weapons, running Union blockades, and developing their own ironworks, Southerners managed to obtain sufficient weaponry. Yankee ingenuity was not confined to Yankees. Nevertheless, as the war dragged on, grave shortage of the two uniforms and blankets prepared to defend. Even with the immense surge of food, civilians and soldiers often went hungry because of supply problems. Forward men, these have they have cheese in their harvest sacks, cried one Southerner officer as he attacked the Yankees. Much of the hunger was caused by a breakdown of Southern victory transportation system, especially where the railroad tracks are destroyed by the Yankee invaders. The economy was the greatest Southern weakness. It was the North's greatest strength. The North was not only a huge farm, but a sprawling factory as well. The Yankees boasted about three-fourths of the nation's wealth, including three-fourths of the 30,000 miles of railroads. The North also controlled the sea. With its vastly superior navy, it established a blockade that, though a sieve at first, soon choked off southern supplies and eventually shattered southern morale. Its sea power also enabled the North to exchange huge quantities of grain for munitions and supplies from Europe, thus adding the output from the factories of Europe to its own. The Union also enjoyed a much larger reserve of manpower. The loyal states had a population of some 2 million. The seceding states had 9 million, including about 3.5 million slaves. Adding to the North's overwhelming supply of soldiery were ever more immigrants from Europe, who continued to pour into the North even during the war. Over 800,000 newcomers arrived between 1861 and 1865, most of them British, Irish, and German. Large numbers of them were induced to enlist in the Union Army. Altogether, about one-fifth of the Union forces were foreign-born, and in some units, military commands were given in four languages. So advantages of North and South, the weaknesses of North and South. Whether immigrant or native, ordinary northern boys were much less prepared than their southerners <coughs> uh, for military life. Yet the northern clodhoppers and shopkeepers eventually adjusted themselves to soldiering and became known for their discipline and determination. The north was much less fortunate in its higher commanders. Lincoln was forced to use a costly trial and error method to sort out effective leaders from the many incompetent political officers until he finally uncovered a general, Ulysses Simpson's Grant, who would crunch his way to victory. In the long run, as the northern strengths were brought to bear, they outweighed those of the south. But when the war began, the chances for southern independence were unusually favorable. Unusually favorable. Certainly better than the prospects of the southern colonies in the turn of a few events could easily have produced a different outcome. The might have beens are fascinating. If the border states had seceded, if the uncertain states of the upper Mississippi Valley had been against the Union, if a wave of northern defeatism had demanded an armistice, and if Britain and or France had broken the blockade, the South might have won. All these possibilities almost became realities, but none of them actually occurred, and lacking their impetus, the South could not hope to win. Dethroning King Cotton Successful revolutions, including the American Revolution of 1776, have generally succeeded because of foreign intervention. The South counted on it, did not get it, and lost. Of all the Confederacy's potential assets, none counted more weightily than the prospect of foreign intervention. Europe's ruling classes were openly sympathetic to the Confederate cause. They had long abhorred the incendiary example of the American democratic experiment, and they cherished a kind of fellow feeling for the Southern's semi-feudal aristocratic social order. In contrast, the masses of working people in Britain, and to some extent in France, were pulling and praying for the North. Many of them had read Uncle Tom's Cabin, and they sensed that the war, though at the outset officially fought over the question of union, might extinguish slavery if the North emerged victorious. The common folk of Britain could not yet cast the ballot, but they could cast the brick. Their certain hostility to any official intervention on behalf of the South evidently had a sobering effect on the British government. Thus, the dead hands of Uncle Tom helped Uncle Sam by restraining the British and the French ironclads from piercing the Union blockade. 
Yet the fact remained that British textile mills depended on American South for 75% of their cotton supply. Wouldn't silent looms force London to speak? Humanitarian sympathies aside, Southerners counted on hard economic need to bring Britain to their aid. Why did King Cotton fail them? He failed in part because he had, he had been so lavishly productive in the immediate pre-war years of 1857 to 1860. Enormous exports of cotton in those years had piled up surpluses in British warehouses. When the shooting started in 1861, British manufacturers had on hand a hefty oversupply of, late, of fiber, cotton. The real pinch did not come until about a year and a half later when thousands of hungry operatives were thrown out of work. But by this time, Lincoln had announced his slave emancipation policy, and the wage slaves of Britain were not going to demand a war to defend the slave owners of the South. The direst effects of the cotton famine in Britain were relieved in several ways. Hunger among unemployed workers was partially eased when certain kind-hearted Americans sent over several cargoes of foodstuffs. As Union armies penetrated the South, they captured or brought considerable supplies of cotton and shipped them to Britain. The Confederates also ran a limited quantity through the blockade. In addition, the cotton growers of Egypt and India, responding to high prices, increased their output. Finally, booming war industries in England, which supplied both the North and the South, relieved unemployment. King Wheat and King Corn, the monarchs of northern agriculture, proved to be more potent, potent potentate than King Cotton. During these war years, the North, blessed with ideal weather, produced bountiful crops of grain and harvested them with McCormick's mechanical reaper. In the same period, the British suffered a series of bad harvests. They were forced to import huge quantities of grain from America, which happened to have the cheapest and most abundant supply. If the British had broken the blockade to gain cotton, they would have provoked the North to war and would have lost this precious granary. Unemployment for some seemed better than hunger for all. Hence, one Yankee journal could exult, Wave the stars and stripes high over us. Let every freeman sing, Old King Cotton's dead and buried. Brave young corn is king. Basically, the British needed the North more than they needed the South. The decisiveness of diplomacy. America's diplomatic front had seldom been so critical as during the Civil War. The South never wholly abandoned its dream of foreign intervention, and Europe's rulers schemed to take advantage of America's distress. The first major crisis with Britain came over the Trent Affair, late in 1861. A Union warship cruising on the high seas north of Cuba stopped a British mail steamer, the Trent, and forcibly removed two Confederate diplomats bound for Europe. Britons were outraged. Upstart Yankees could not so boldly offend the mistresses of the seas. War preparations buzzed and redcoat troops embarked for Canada with bands blaring, I wish I was not Dixie. The London Foreign Office prepared an ultimatum demanding surrender of the prisoners and an apology. But luckily, slow communications gave passions on both sides a chance to cool. Lincoln came to see the Trent prisoners as, quote, white elephants and reluctantly released them, one war at a time, he reportedly said. Another major crisis in Anglo-American relations arose over the unneutral building in Britain of Confederate commerce, commerce raiders notably the Alabama. These vessels were not warships within the meaning of loophole British law because they left their shipyards unarmed and picked up their guns elsewhere. The Alabama escaped in 1862 to the Portuguese Azores and there took on weapons and a crew from two British ships that followed it. Although flying the Confederate flag and officered by Confederates, it was manned by Britons and never entered a Confederate port. Britain was thus the chief naval base of the Confederacy. <clears throat> The Alabama lighted the skies from Europe to the Far East with burning hulks of Yankee merchantmen. All told, this British pirate captured over 60 vessels. Competing British shippers were delighted, while an angered North had to divert naval strength from its blockade for wild goose chases. The barnacled Alabama finally accepted a challenge from a stronger Union cruiser off the coast of France in 1864 and was quickly destroyed. The Alabama was beneath the waves, but the issue of British-built Confederate raiders stayed afloat. Under prodding by the American minister, Charles Francis Adams, the British gradually perceived that allowing such ships to be built was a dangerous precedent that might someday be used against them. In 1863, London openly violated its own leaky laws and seized another raider being built for the South. But despite greater official efforts by Britain to remain truly neutral, Confederate commerce destroyers, chiefly British built, captured more than 250 Yankee ships, severely crippling the American American Marine, which never fully recovered. Lowering Northerners looked further north and talked openly of securing revenge by grabbing Canada when the war was over. Foreign flare-ups. A final Anglo-American crisis which touched off in 1863 by the Laird, Laird Rams, two Confederate warships being constructed in the shipyard of Laird and sons in Great Britain. 
Designed to destroy the wooden ships of the Union Navy with their iron rams and large caliber guns, they were far more dangerous than the ships lightly armed rams. Delivered to the South, they probably would have sent the blockading squadron and then fought northern cities under their fire. In retaliation, the North doubtless would have invaded Canada, and a full draft war with Britain would have erupted. But Minister Adams took a hard line, warning that this is war if the rams were released. At the last minute, the London government relented and, brought, and bought two ships for the Royal Navy. Everyone seemed satisfied, except the disappointed Confederates. Britain also eventually re, re, repented its sorry role in the Alabama business. It agreed in 1871 to submit the Alabama to arbitration, and in 1872 paid American claimants $15.5 million for damages caused by wartime commerce raiders. American rancor was also directed at Canada, where despite the vigilance of British authorities, Southern agents plotted to burn northern cities. One Confederate raid into Vermont left three banks plundered and one American citizen dead. Hatred of England burned especially fierce among Irish Americans, and they unleashed their fury on Canada. They raised several tiny quote-unquote armies of a few, green, few hundred green-shirted men and launched invasions of Canada, notably in 1866 and 1870. The Canadians condemned the Washington government for permitting such violations of neutrality, but the administration was hampered by the presence of so many Irish-American voters. As fate would have it, two great nations emerged from the fiery furnace of the American Civil War. One was a reunited United States, and the other was a united Canada. The British Parliament established the Dominion of Canada in 1867. It was partly designed to bolster the Canadians, both politically and spiritually, against the possible vengeance of the United States. Emperor Napoleon III of France, taking advantage of Americans' preoccupation with his own internal problems, dispatched a French army to occupy Mexico City in 1863. The following year, he installed on the ruins of the crushed republic his puppet, Austrian Archduke Maximilian, as Emperor of Mexico. Both sending the army and enthroning Maximilian were flagrant violations of the Monod Doctrine. Napoleon was gambling that the Union would collapse and thus America would be too weak to enforce its hands-off policy in the Western Hemisphere. The North as long as it was convulsed by war, pursued a walk-on-egg policy towards France. But when the shooting stopped in 1865, Secretary of State Seward, speaking with the authority of a nearly million war-tempered bayonets, prepared to march south. Napoleon realized that his costly gamble was doomed. He reluctantly took French leave of his ill-starred puppet in 1867, and Maximilian soon crumbled uh, ingloriously before a Mexican firing squad. President Davis versus President Lincoln. The Confederate government, like King Cotton, harbored fatal weaknesses. Its constitution, borrowing liberally from that of the Union, contained one key defect. Created by secession, it could not logically deny future secession to its constituent states. Jefferson Davis, while making his vow to states' rights, had in view a well-knit central government, but determined states' rights -right supporters fought him bitterly to the end. The Richmond regime encountered difficulty even in persuading certain state troops to serve outside their own borders. The governor of Georgia, a belligerent states writer, at times seemed ready to secede from the secession and fight both sides. States' rights were no less damaging to the Confederates' Confederacy than Yankee sabers. Sharp-featured President Davis, tense, humorless, legalistic, and stubborn, was repeatedly in hot water. Although an eloquent orator and an able administrator, he at no time enjoyed real personal popularity and was often at loggerheads with his Congress. At a times, there was serious talk of impeachment. Unlike Lincoln, Davis was somewhat imperious and inclined to defy rather than to lead public opinion. Suffering acutely from neuralgia and other nervous disorders, including a cancer, he overworked himself with details of both civil government and military operations. No one could doubt his courage, considering his own and his own actually beyond his power. He was probably beyond mere more. Lincoln Tactful, quiet, patient, and calm, he developed an inherent way of thinking and leading a certain course of action. Holding the most superior of the Union was an inspiring evidence of his internal and incredible knowledge of himself and forbearance for the adversary of power. He had never carried war with the Union into the fight, and had only repeated the battles of the Union of Canada. And I dare say, he was generally right, and he always said what he means. Limited. 
Honest Abe Lincoln, when inaugurated, laid his hand on the Bible and swore a solemn oath to uphold the Constitution. Then, driven by sheer necessity, he proceeded to press through holes in that hallowed document. He sagely concluded that if we did not do so and pass the question in favor, there might not be a Constitution of the United United States of men. The rail splitter was no hair splitter. But such infractions were not, in general, petty things. Congress, as is often true in times of crisis, generally accepted or confirmed the president's questionable act. Lincoln, though accused of being a simple truth and tyrant, did not believe that his iron-handed authority would continue once the Union was destroyed. As he pointed, pointedly remarked in 1863, a man suffering from temporary illness would not persist in feeding on bitter medicines for the remainder of his household life. Congress was not in session when the war erupted, so Lincoln grabbed the reins into his own hands. Brushing aside legal objections, he boldly proclaimed a blockade. He arbitrarily increased the size of the federal army, something that only Congress can do under the Constitution. He directed the Secretary of the Treasury to advance $2 million without appropriation or security to three provinces for military purposes, a grave irregularity contrary to the Constitution. He suspended the precious privilege of the writ of habeas corpus so that anti unionists might be summarily arrested. In taking this step, he defied a dubious ruling by the Chief Justice that the only safeguards of habeas corpus could be set aside only by an authorization of Congress. Habeas corpus is being uh, charged in defense of a trial. Lincoln's regime was guilty of many other high-handed acts. For example, it arranged for supervised voting in the border states. There, the intimidated citizen, holding a colored ballot indicating his party preference, had to march between two lines of armed troops. The federal officials also ordered the suspension of certain newspapers and the arrest of their editors on grounds of obstructing the war. Jefferson Davis was less able than Lincoln to exercise arbitrary power, mainly because of confirmed writers who fanned an intense spirit of localism. To the very end of the conflict, the owners of the horse-drawn vans in Petersburg, Virginia, prevented the sensible journey of the incoming and outgoing track of their military vital railroad. The South seemed willing to lose the war before it would surrender local rights, and it did. Volunteers and Drafties, North and South Ravenous, the gods of war demanded men, lots of men. Northern armies were at first manned solely by volunteers, with each state assigned a quota based on population. But in 1863, after volunteering had slackened off, Congress passed a federal conscription law for the first time on a nationwide scale in the United States. The provisions were grossly unfair to the poor. Rich boys, including young John D. Rockefeller, could hire substitutes to go in their steed, <clears throat> or purchase exemption outright by paying $300. $300 men was the scornful epithet applied to these slackers. Draftees who did not have the necessary cash complained that their bandit-like government demanded $300 or your life. The draft was especially damned in the Democratic stronghold of the North, notably in New York City. A frightful riot broke out in 1863, touched off largely by underprivileged and anti-Black Irish Americans who shouted, down with Lincoln and down with the draft. For several days, the city was at the mercy of a burning, drunken, pillaging mob. Scores of lives were lost, and the victims included many lynched blacks. Elsewhere in the North, conscription met with resentment and an occasional minor riot. More than 90% of the Union troops were volunteers, since social and patriotic pressures to enlist were strong. As able-bodied men became scarcer, generous bounties for enlistment were offered by federal, state, and local authorities. An enterprising and money-wise volunteer might legitimately pocket more than $1,000. With money flowing so freely, an unsavory crew of bounty brokers and substitute brokers sprang up at home and abroad. They combed the poorhouses of the British Isles and Western Europe, and many an Irishman or a German was befuddled with whiskey and induced to enlist. A number of these slippery bounty boys deserted, volunteered elsewhere, and netted another handsome haul. The records reveal that one bounty jumper repeated his profitable operation 32 times. But desertion was by no means confined to bounty jumpers. The roles of the Union Army recorded about 200,000 deserters of all classes, and the Confederate authorities were plagued with a runaway problem of similar dimensions. Like the North, the South at first relied mainly on volunteers, but since the Confederacy was much less populous, it scraped the bottom of its manpower barrel much more quickly. Cripsters observed that any man who could see lightning and hear thunder was just fit for service. The Richmond regime, robbing both cradle and graves, pages 7 to 6, was forced to nearly a year earlier than the Union. Confederate tax regulations also were superior to the population. As in the North, the rich men could hire substitutes or purchase exemptions. 
slave owners or overseers in the whole of Africa. These slave privileges were later modified and made for the bad feelings of the left classes, many of whom complained that this was a rich man poor, a poor man's life. Why sacrifice one's life to save an affluent neighbor's slave? No large scale death rights broke out in the South like in New York City, and the Confederates in the 80s often found it prudent to avoid those areas inhabited by sharp shooting mountain whites who were branded Tories, traders, and Yankee lovers. The Economic Stresses of War Blessed with the lion's share of the wealth, the North rode through the financial breakers much more smoothly than the South. Excise taxes on tobacco and alcohol were substantially increased by Congress. An income tax was levied for the first time in the nation's experience, and although the rates were painlessly low by later standards, they netted millions of dollars. Customs receipts likewise proved to be an important revenue raiser. Early in 1861, after enough anti Southern members had succeeded, Congress passed the Moral Tariff Act, superseding the low tariff of 1857. It increased the existing duties some 5 to 10 percent, boosting them to about the moderate level of the Walker Tariff of 1856. But these modest rates were soon pushed sharply upward by the necessities of war. The increases were designed to partly raise additional revenue and partly provide more protection for the prosperous manufacturers who were being plucked by the new internal tax. A protective tariff thus became identified with the Republican Party as American industrialists, mostly Republican, waxed fat on the welcome benefits. The Washington Treasury also issued greenbacks paper money, uh, totaling nearly $450 million at face value. This printing press currency was inadequately supported by gold, and hence its value was determined by the nation's credit. Greenbacks thus fluctuated with the fortunes of Union arms, and at one low point were worth only 39 cents on the gold dollar. The holders of these notes, victims of creeping inflation, were indirectly taxed as the value of the currency slowly withered in their hands. Yet borrowing far outstripped both greenbacks and taxes as a money raiser. The Federal Treasury netted $200,621,916,786 through the sales of bonds, which bore interest and which were payable at a later date. The modern technique of selling these issues to people directly through drives and payroll deductions had not yet been devised. Accordingly, the Treasury was forced to market its bonds through the private banking house of J. Cook & Company, which received a commission of three-eighths of 1% on all sales. With both profits and patriotism at stake, the bankers succeeded in making effective appeals to citizen purchasers. A financial Launched partly as a stimulant to the sale of government bonds, it was also designed to establish a standard banknote currency. The country was then flooded with depreciated rag money issued by unreliable bankers. Banks that joined the national banking system could buy government bonds and issue sound paper money backed by them. The War Born National Banking Act thus turned out to be the first significant taken toward a unified banking network since 1837 when the Bank of the U.S. Uh, was killed by Andrew Jackson. Spawned by the war, this new system continued to function for 50 years until replaced by the Federal Reserve Bank in 1913. An impoverished South was set up roads. Custom duties were shelved off as the spoils of the Union blockade tightened. Large issues of Confederate bonds were sold at home and abroad amounted to nearly $400 million. The Richmond regime also increased taxes sharply and imposed a 10% levy on farm produce. But in general, the state's right Southerners were immovably opposed to heavily direct taxation by a central authority. Only about 1% of the total income was raised in this way. As revenue began to dry up, the Confederate government was forced to print blue-backed paper money with complete abandon. Runaway inflation occurred as Southern presses continued to grind out the poorly backed Treasury notes, totaling in all more than $1 billion. The Confederate paper dollar finally sank to the point where it was worth only 1.6 cents when Lee surrendered. Overall, the war inflicted a 9,000% inflation rate on the Confederacy, contrasted with 80% for the Union. The North's economic boom. War prosperity in the North is a little short of miraculous. The marvel is that a divided nation can fight a costly conflict for four long years and then emerge seemingly more prosperous than ever before. New factories, Growing prices resulting in inflation. Unfortunately, it came from day labor and the white collar worker to some extent, <clears throat> but the manufacturers and business all raked in the fortunes of war. <clears throat> the Civil War brought a million artifacts for the first time in American history. Though a few individuals of extreme wealth 
should have been done earlier. Many of these newly rich were noisy, gaudy, brassy, and given to extravagant living. Their emergence really illustrates the truth that some gluttony and greed always are the devotion and self-sacrifice called for by war. The story of speculators and speculators was roughly the same in both camps. But graft was more flagrant in the North than in the South, partly because there was more to steal. Yankee sharpness appeared at its worst. Dishonest agents, putting profits above patriotism, palmed off aged and blind horses on the government. Unscrupulous northern manufacturers supplied shoes with cardboard soles and fast disintegrating uniforms of reprocessed or shoddy wool rather than virgin wool. Hence, the reproachful term shoddy millionaires was doubly fair. One profiteer reluctantly admitted that his profits were painfully large. Newly invented labor-saving machinery enabled the North to expand economically, even though the cream of its manpower was being drained off to the fighting front. The sewing machine wrought wondrous success in fabri- fabricating uniforms and military footwear. The marriage of military need and innovative machinery largely ended the production of custom tailored clothing. Graduated standard measurements and introduced creating sizes that were widely used in the civilian garment industry ever after. You have a size small, medium, large, 36, whatever your size is. That, that was created during the Civil War. Clattering mechanical reapers, which numbered about 20, 250,000 by 1865, proved hardly less potent than thundering guns. They not only released tens of thousands of farm boys for the army, but fed them from their field rations. Fed them their field rations. They produced provided which were to which the North had been able to find and retain the supplies from the bar. They contributed to the fever and prosperity of the North and extended and enabled the Union to weather the fight of the war with flying colors. Other industries were humming. The discovery of petroleum got the use of the Spanish and the Russians to the Dunn of Pennsylvania. The result was the birth of a new industry consisting of petroleum, electricity, and coal oil burning. Pioneers Uh, were free gold nuggets and made free land in the Bay Area. Let's try it again. Major magnets were free gold nuggets and made free land in the Bay Area. Strong propellant was a federal department. Only a major magnet was a federal government. The Civil War was a woman's war. Other women on both sides stepped up to the fighting front or close behind it. More than 400 women accompanied husbands and sweethearts into battle by posing as male soldiers. Other women took on dangerous spy missions. One woman was executed for smuggling gold to the Confederacy. Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, America's first female physician, helped organize the U.S. Sanitary Commission to assist the Union armies in the field. The commission trained nurses, collected medical supplies, and equipped hospitals. Commission work helped many women to acquire the organizational skills and the self-confidence that would propel the women's movement forward after the war. Heroically energetic Clara Barton and dedicated Dorothea Dix, superintendent of nurses for the Union Army, helped transform nursing from a lowly service into a profession, and in the process opened up another major sphere of employment for women in the post-war era. Equally renowned in the South, Sally Thompson ran a nursing infirmary for the wounded Confederate soldiers and was awarded the rank of captain. Still on the women's North Dakota organized bazaars and fairs to raise millions of dollars for the relief of widows, orphans, and disabled soldiers. <clears throat> a crushed cotton kingdom. The South fought to the point of exhaustion. Suffocation caught on the blockade, together with the North, brought the entire to trouble for it. Nothing clear to the wealth in 1860, the South claimed almost 12 percent of the land. Before the war, the average per capita income of Southerners, including today, was about two thirds of that of Northerners. Civil War squeezed the average southern income to a fifth of the northerner level, where it remained for the rest of the century. The South's bid for its independence exacted a cruel and devastating cost. Transportation collapsed. The South was even driven to the economic cannibalism of pulling up rails from the less used 
fine, but it's called the main one. Window weights were melted down into the port. Lords replaced Pens became so scarce that they were loaned with reluctance. And to the brutal end, the South mustered remarkable resourcefulness and skill. Women buoyed up by buoyed up the men of many of whom had taken less war at his hand to be heartily considered. The proposal was made by a number of women, and they cut off their own hands and followed their own. But the project was not accomplished without the study of the blockade. Self sacrificing women tried in denying themselves the silk and satin of the Lord's boots. The Torah song, the Southern Girl, tested the whole melody. So hurrah, hurrah, the Southern Knights of Hurrah, hurrah for the homeless and girls the Southern Lady Square. At the war's end, the Northern They quickly found the chance to attack the rich and the city to work in their way to high Paris and other centers. The manufacturing moguls of the north, excellent in the full fledged industry of Europe, were destined to increase the problem of the American economic and political life. Hitherto, the agrarian heterodoxy of the south had essentially crossed the line between the American democracy of the north. Now, cotton capitalism had lost that dream of American capitalism. The south of 1865 was to be rich and liberal. War heroes, wounds, and memories. All right, the next chapter we'll talk more specifically about the actual battles and wars and fighting itself.